Good evening. Okay, I haven't done anything yet, right? But welcome to the Stripe conference night. My name is uh, Kurt van Mensvoort. I'm director of Next Nature Network and a fellow at Eindhoven University here in Eindhoven. And I have the great pleasure today to, uh, to be the supporting act and the moderator for uh, a lecture from who I think is the most important thinker in the world alive on technology today. <laughs> he will be on stage very soon, in about 10 minutes, but first, um, I'd like you to imagine that you are uh, an alien from outer space, and you're looking at the dark side of the planet. A thousand years ago, this dark side of the planet would have been pitch black. But nowadays, recently, something is happening. There are all these lights. Is the planet on fire? Is it blossoming? Is it springtime on planet Earth? We don't need really know, but if we zoom in in the different regions, we can learn a lot. Like, for instance, okay, who are the blue states and the red states? You see India emerging. You see Europe as a big Christmas tree with many lights and one big star in the east. You also see blank regions, like Greenland. Not much happening there, yet. Uh, or the Amazon forest. Uh, the Sahara Desert, where you also see certain natural animal an elements sticking out, out, like the Nile River. And there are also social and political decisions that you can read in this visual. The North Korean border, okay, so very different decisions in Pyongyang or in Seoul, clearly. And one question I also ask myself, like, okay, you see all these cities and these regions of light, and where in the world is the biggest region of light? You would think it's a big city like Tokyo, New York, but it turns out that this is the biggest city of light, the biggest region of light. It's this region from Amsterdam to Brussels to Cologne, and we are here. So if the aliens from outer space would decide to arrive on Earth and maybe land, <laughs> it might be on this rooftop. It's a special region, Eindhoven, the city of light. It's good to be here. And um, nowadays, every human being has to cope with new technology, not only in the western part of the world, not only in these big urban regions, everywhere on the planet. And we know so little about what technology is. So to understand this, I, I like to yeah, start at the beginning. It is now some 4.5 billion years ago since our planet came into existence. And for a very long time, it was just this lonely rock floating in space. There was a geosphere, but it took some 3 billion years before the biosphere evolved upon our planet. Three billion years. And one billion years later, people arrived. So that's us. We have just arrived. However, our presence does not go unnoticed, because with our ingenuity and creativity and technology, we, cross, we cause the rise of a whole new sphere on, on Earth. Kevin Kelly calls it the technium. Some call it the noosphere, the technosphere. What is happening? And clearly, well, the biosphere evolved upon the geosphere underneath and has all kinds of interactions with it. But also this technosphere is emerging from the biosphere and has all kinds of interactions with it. Our next speaker already 20 years ago told us that we are living in a time in which uh, the born and the made are fusing. And as a result, also our notions of nature and culture are becoming complex. Because typically we think of nature as everything born, plants, animals, climate, the universe, whereas culture, that is what we do. But now this is, I think, shifting. And I want to get into this with a very simple graph that we can all understand. If I put on one axis born versus made, and on the other axis I would put controlled versus autonomous or uncontrolled, 
I've now created four quadrants, and I can put all kinds of things in there. So first, in the born controlled quadrant, you would find things like a rainbow rose, a bonsai tree, genetically modified banana or chicken. These are all natural born entities that we now control up to a level that you say, okay, it's not nature anymore. It's technology, it's design. There's also still a lot of nature, born nature left that we do not control. Think of viruses, volcanoes, lightning or the sun. The diameter of the sun is 100 times the diameter of our Earth, and we don't have any control over the sun. So, yeah, we can be a bit modest. We're not gods, we're not the masters of the universe. Then on the made controlled side, you will find things like a car, a telephone, a robot dog, or a light bulb. Not too exciting, but in this upper quadrant, things become more interesting, because there we find entities like traffic jams, uh, the financial system, the cities, computer viruses, things we made, but are we still controlling these entities? So it might be that we are living in a time where we used to think of nature as everything born, but this is now shifting to a new 21st century notion of nature as everything that is growing autonomously beyond our control. It might work, Although in that fourth quadrant, you have the mind shift, because there you see that technology also becomes nature in a way. And we typically think of nature and technology as opposites, like black and white. But here we learn the new dynamics of technology becoming a nature of its own. Some examples from our own life. I think everyone in the room here is still old enough to have lived without a mobile phone? And is there anyone in the room who does not own a mobile phone? Hands, please. I don't see any hands. Nobody? We all bought it? Yeah, okay, of course, I also own one. And I remember when I bought it, I thought, okay, most people around me have a mobile phone, let's buy the gadget. But nowadays, when I leave my house without the mobile phone, without the smartphone, I feel I feel naked. I, I feel as if I'm missing a limb. And I quickly run back to my house to grab the phone and feel like a whole human being again. This technology, it's not part of my body, it's not in my body, but it's very intimate and part of my lifestyle. This all happened in 10 years. I thought it was just a gadget, but it's transforming our lives. These are all the razors I used throughout my life. So I started with a simple stick, two blades, and this morning I shaved myself with this six-bladed, battery-powered, LED-enabled monster that looks a bit like a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and I wonder, is this evolution? Or is this a symbol, perhaps, of the co-evolution between people and technology? L just like the bees and the flowers co-evolved. The bees take the nectar from the flowers, but also spread, them, spread their pollen so that the, the flowers can propagate. We help technology to propagate. And where does this end? Because I read in the newspaper that biodiversity is decreasing, and then I walk into a supermarket and I see an increase of, well, technodiversity is prob probably a better term. There are now more patents known on the planet than species. What is happening? The financial system. We made it, but who's controlling this? Is it time that we look at the financial system as an ecology in its own right? And then what can bankers learn from farmers who have extensive experience of coping with semi-autonomous ecologies like weather and climate? And how do we deal with this phenomenon? I don't know if people know this image. This is not some star nebula far, far away. No, much closer than you think. This is a map of the Internet. Every device connected to the internet plotted as a dot, and all the lines between the devices plotted as lines. Uh, and then you get this, I think, wonderful structure. It's almost natural. And, and we were there when it emerged. And as our next speaker will explain, I'm sure, this is not finished. It's all around us. It's almost as if we are the fish who don't know it's wet. We're swimming in technology. 
And we need wisdom. We don't only need technique and gadgets and science. We also need wisdom and good, great thinkers that help us find our path. So I am delighted to be able to introduce to you the co-founding editor of Wired magazine. One of the initiators also of the quantified self movement. Uh, the writer of books like The Technium, but also the classic Out of Control that was used by the directors of The Matrix. They gave this book to all their actors. You have to read this before we're going to do this movie. He also did a book Cool Tools and recently The Inevitable. Please, a warm welcome for Mr. Kevin Kelly. Thank you for that fabulous, over-the-top, untrue introduction. <laughs> I have to disagree with the superlatives, uh, but I understand that it was done as a compliment. So thank you for appearing here, um, for coming out to hear my thoughts on where we're going with technology in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, I have to indicate, of course, that I'm only mostly in this conversation talking about digital technology, the technology of bits and electronics. There's a whole other world of biotechnology, which I'm not addressing, which, as you could see, is really convergent with the technology that we're making with bits. But I think, um, in many ways, this is the central theme of the next 10 or 20 years. Biology will certainly have a place, and it's probably going to be the thing after um, digital stuff. But I want to give you a little glimpse of some of the trends. And, and, and I have to preface by saying that the word inevitable is, is a loaded word. It's a word that is heavy. It has a lot of cultural baggage. Some people might find it a red flag. But um, I mean it in kind of a very loose way in the sense that all technology has a, a leaning a kind of a, a tendency and urgency towards certain directions that are actually formed by the very nature of the technology itself. It's actually formed by the nature of physics and chemistry that underpins all the technologies. And just as we normally find lots of animals, uh, evolution reinventing the four-footed, four-legged animal again and again because of physics, and we transfer that into the four-wheeled vehicle because of physics, in the same way, the very fundamental character of the matter of the universe tilts our technologies in certain directions. And if we can understand those directions, that those leanings, those tendencies, that gives us a sense of where things are going. And finally, I want to say that I'm talking about the large forms, the genres of technology rather than, the, say, the species. The species are inherently unpredictable. While we can forecast that almost any planet we would probably find four-legged creatures or four-wheel vehicles, those things are inevitable, but the species of a zebra, say, is completely unpredictable. In the same way, I would say, yes, any planet invented um, electricity, wires, is going to probably invent telephones. So the telephone was inevitable, but the iPhone was not. The internet was inevitable, probably found on any planet that had the telephone, but Twitter is not inevitable. Those are completely stochastic, random, unpredictable. And the last image I want to kind of give in your heads is to imagine a huge valley, and there's rainfall falling down into the valley, and we're going to try and follow the path of one drop as it goes down the hills in the valleys. That path is inherently unpredictable, the specific path of a particular drop of rain. But the direction is inevitable. It's down. So I'm kind of looking for those kinds of gravities, and so, so to speak, in the technological world that are moving things in certain directions. And one of the most important of all those directions that we can see coming is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is inevitable because evolution itself continues to make minds. It has, has produced 
minds again and again in the animal kingdom all independently. It wants to kind of make minds because a mind is this highly organized thing that is in the direction that evolution has been going. And now that same evolution is trying to create minds and technology and we're going to try many, many times and have been trying a long time and we will continue until we produce many kinds of minds. AI, also called artificial intelligence, is, in, is a buzzword. It's, it's in the hype cycle right now. You're hearing a lot about it. But I hope to give you a couple of different ways to think about it that might convince you that this is actually a very big thing. So, first of all, I have to say that it are, is already here. It's like Marshall McLuhan says, it says, I'm very careful never to predict anything that's not already here. So, artificial intelligence has been trying to become something big for 50 years, but it has already become something big. If you are in a hospital in the back offices, um, AI is being used to analyze x-rays, and they do it better than humans. And so my advice to most parents is don't let your kid decide to try to be a radiologist because those jobs are not going to be around very long. The AIs can do it better than humans right now. And of course, if you have Netflix, you are using an AI or listening to AI in terms of making the recommendations. Um, and in the law field, um, para, uh, paralegals used to go through the evidence, and now we have AIs go through it much better than a human paralegal. And I flew here on a long flight, and maybe 12 hours long, and the human pilots were only flying the plane for seven to eight minutes. The rest of the time, the AI is flying. But the thing is, is actually, nobody calls it an AI. AI is really defined as anything cool in intelligence that we haven't been able to do. Because as soon as we are able to do it, as soon as we can do it, we stop calling it AI. We call it machine learning or expert systems or something like that. So AI is always that thing that's receding into the future. It's always that thing that we can't yet do. And as soon as we do it, it's boring, stupid, of course, obvious, and not yet the AI that we want. So there's a definitional challenges in that we're doing these things, they become more and more powerful, but they're not quite what we think of as AI. So I tend to not try to use the word AI, though it's unavoidable. Um, I, I think we can use other words. One of the other things that this AI, this artificial smartness can do right now, is it can actually look at a photograph and describe pretty accurately what's happening inside the photograph in any language. And, of course, you've heard of the fact that AI has, the Google AlphaGo, has beat the world's greatest Go champion, a feat that even the AI experts didn't think would happen for another 10 years. That shows you a little bit of the pace at which things are going. It's a very complicated, non-obvious way, and even the guy who lost, um, uh, Sol, Sol Dahl, he said that in the game three, I think move 37, that that was an actually beautifully creative move. It wasn't just a machine move. It was, it was a brilliant move. So that's sort of where we are. And Google has also um, taught its AI how to learn how to play a video game. Now, if you've been playing video games for the past 10 years, you've been playing against AIs. This is different. They didn't teach the AI how to play a game. They taught it how to learn how to play the game. They didn't teach it the game. They just showed it the game, and it watched the game, and it learned how to play these retro 1970s video games better than a human. So this is artificial learning, which is very, very powerful, very profound. And of course, we now have these conversational bots like Alexa and um, Echo and Google Home, where you talk to them and they talk back. And their comprehension is actually pretty impressive. It's not 100%, but it's getting very, very close. I like to call this artificial smartness, to try to get away from some of the baggage that we have with artificial intelligence. And I want to stress that this smartness also allows us to think about 
the intelligences in different ways than humans. So your calculator, whether it's on your phone or your watch or on a desktop, is smarter than you are right now in arithmetic. Okay, it's smarter than you are in arithmetic. We're not freaked out by that. That seems perfectly reasonable. Your GPS unit, whether it's on your phone or on your dashboard, is smarter than you are in spatial navigation. And Google or Bing, whatever you're using, is smarter than you are in total recall because it has memorized every single word on six billion web pages. Okay, every single word on all those pages is in its memory. That's an inhuman feat. That is just beyond human capability. So it is way superior to you in memory. And so we want these AIs to drive our cars because they don't think like humans. They don't drive like humans. They aren't distracted about whether they left the stove on or whether they should have majored in finance. They are just driving focused on driving. And we want them because we as human drivers are terrible. We're easily distracted. We're not at all consistent. And last year, human drivers killed one million other humans worldwide. We should not be allowed to drive. It's very simple. We're not very good at driving. We want a different kind of mind a mind that maybe doesn't have any consciousness to really focus on driving. So we might, even, we might even come up with AIs that we advertise as being conscious free because they're not going to be distracted. So we have our own intelligence has a rather dumb idea about what intelligence is. We tend to think of intelligence as the single dimension kind of like an, uh, a graph of decibel, loudness, that begins say, in the tiny, quiet intelligence of a mouse, and then gets large, uh, louder for a monkey, and goes on through an idiot, or an average person, a genius, and then these super AIs. That's totally wrong. That's just not what intelligence is. Intelligence is much closer to a group of very different nodes of thinking, different kinds of thinking like deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning, symbolic reasoning, spatial reasoning, emotional intelligence, all these different types of cognition that are grouped together and codependent on each other into kind of a suite, uh, an ecosystem. Or you can imagine maybe these things as being a symphony of different notes where each musical instrument is playing a different kind of sound and those sounds may have different Amplitudes, loudnesses. And so that image or that, 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 that symphony may vary from person to person as some have greater degrees of spatial reasoning than, say, others. And when we come to animals, animals have a very similar kind of a suite where they have uh, maybe sometimes even the same instrument playing the same mode of cognition that may even be louder than ours. So a squirrel, a rodent, can remember the exact location of 10,000 different nuts over many, many years, a feat that eclipses our own memory. And of course, yet yeah, it's probably dimmer, in, so to speak, in other aspects, other kinds of cognition. When we go to the machines, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to make them more and more complicated and add more and more subsystems of varieties of cognition. But we're going to engineer them to exceed us in certain of those dimensions. And all these intelligences obey the general engineering maxim, which is that you cannot optimize everything. There's always a trade-off. You can't just have, well, I'm going to make an intelligence that's optimized and maximum and everything. No, you, that, that is just not reality. You always have to trade off between things. And so that argues against the idea that there's a general purpose intelligence. Human intelligence is not a general purpose intelligence. We sometimes claim it is because until now, we've had no other really complicated intelligence to compare it to. 
once we start to discover and manufacture other kinds of intelligences and fill out all the possibilities, we'll discover that human intelligence is way off the edge of the, of the possibilities, like we are at the edge of the galaxy. We're not at the center, we're not at the center of the solar system, we're not at the center of a galaxy. We're always at the edge of things. So the machine intelligence is also going to have trade-offs and we'll engineer them for particular reasons. And in some cases, their intelligence will exceed ours in certain dimensions. So the idea of smarter than human is not a meaningful statement. There is no intelligence smarter than human, or I should say all intelligences are smarter than humans in some dimension. So the point, though, is that these are different types of thinking. When you think of AI, you want to think about the fact that we are going to create many kinds of AIs, not just a single one, many types of thinking, maybe hundreds or thousands. Think of them as different species of thinking. And we're going to kind of populate the possibility space of all the possible ways there are to have cognition. And many of them are going to be types of thinking that don't exist in our minds or in biology at all. So when we made artificial flying, we call them airplanes, we studied how flying was done in the biological world. We saw that they were mostly flapping wings and sometimes vibrating wings. But when we came to make an airplane, we tried those and they didn't work. What worked for us was to make a fixed wing that didn't move and have a propeller. That type of flying does not occur in nature, at least on our planet. And so we invented a wholly different type of flight. And we're going to invent wholly new types of thinking that have not yet existed. And there may be, bus uh, there may be difficult problems in business or in science that are so complicated that they may be beyond our own ability to solve, our own human minds. And so we may require a two-step process where first we invent another type of thinking called an AI to work with us to solve the problem. That together, the two kinds of thinking, two kinds of minds, are actually smart enough to solve this problem. So another way of thinking about these many, maybe thousands of different species of thinking and AIs is to think of them as alien intelligences. Because the thing that they're doing is not that they're smarter than humans, is that they're different. They think different. And in this new economy, thinking different is the engine of innovation and wealth. It's all about thinking different, having a different idea, coming up with a different way of doing something. And the challenge for all of us, both individually and in corporately, is how do we think differently when we're connected day and night to seven billion other people? It's kind of easy to think differently when you're isolated off to the side, but then your ideas don't mean very much because they're not connected to anything else. It's very easy to be, these days, to connect it all the time to seven billion people, but how do you think differently? And I think one of the things that AIs are gonna do is gonna help us to continue to come up with new and different ideas while we are connected to seven billion people. The second important thing, besides the fact that when you think of AIs, you want to think of not smarter than humans, but different than humans, the second thing about AI is that it is launching the second industrial revolution. Now, the first industrial revolution was this period, was this invention, was this transition that basically built everything we see around here. In fact, it built this entire city and from the map of the, the lights, it built this entire region. It was all possible because of basically one major discovery. And that discovery I like to call artificial power. During the hunter-gatherer age, during the agricultural age, the only way you could make anything significant, build a house, make a road, make clothes, was to use muscle power, natural power, whether of human or of an animal. So if you wanted to make a house, you had to either 
use the energy from yourself or from animals to make it. If you want to make a road, you had to use your own energy of, a, of humans or of animals. And that was the only way to get anything done. And that was very, very limited. And so the, 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 the genius, the power, the revolution that was invented when we discovered how to harness the energy in coal, hydro, electricity, gasoline, was we unleashed artificial power that went way beyond our own individual muscle power. And artificial power is the same power that when you drive down the street in your car and you turn your switch or push your button, you are harnessing the equivalent of the muscle power of 250 horses. That's 250 horsepower. Just to go down the street. And of course, you could take that same power and you could throw up a skyscraper or you could make a railway across the country. You could use it to churn out kilometer after kilometer of fabric and cloth or chairs. The, the, everything that we see is now possible and made by the fact that we invented artificial power. But more importantly, we took that artificial power and we distributed it on a grid, an electrical grid, and it went, we sent it to every home and every factory and every farmhouse. And now the inhabitants there, the citizens, they didn't have to generate that power themselves. They could buy it as a utility, as a commodity. It was just you bought as much electricity as you wanted to use. So you didn't, weren't responsible for creating it. It was a common wealth. It was, it was a utility. And that was also the source of great amount of entrepreneurship because you could have a farmer who is, you know, trying to water his cows or his crops with a muscle-powered hand pump, and he says, I have an idea. I'm going to buy me some of that artificial power, and I'm going to invent a new kind of pump that uses it, and we call that an electric pump. And that innovation multiplied by a million times is the Industrial Revolution. Take things that were required muscles before and then add artificial power and then you have this electric pump and then you just keep doing this around and around and you have today's world on all the things and all the levels of prosperity that we came with having cheap artificial power. Well, we're going to do the same thing now with artificial intelligence. We're going to take that artificial, I mean that electric pump, an automated pump, and we're going to buy some artificial intelligence as a commodity. We don't have to make the artificial intelligence, we can buy it. And we're going to make a smart pump, which will regulate its use and minimize its use and knows when it turns on. It can be much more powerful with a smaller amount of energy, etc. And so we're going to multiply that by a million times. And that's going to be the second industrial revolution. So another way to think about it is you, going back to those 250 horses that we put inside the engine of your car. We're now going to add 250 minds to it. And that's the self-driving car. So it's self-driving and self-powered. And that's the new you know, auto-driven driverless car taking the artificial power and then artificial intelligence to, together, combined. And like electricity, we're going to distribute the AI on a grid called the cloud. So it will become a commodity, a utility. You won't have to make your AI. You can buy your AI from the cloud. You can buy as much as you want. And you can generate and use it in the way you would electricity. And by the way, you can do that right as soon as I finish talking, or if you're in a hurry, you can do it right now. You can log on and purchase some AI from Google or Microsoft or IBM, and you'll have AI, and, you, and it's cheap. It's six cents, 100 hits. And so already it's a commodity. So I suggest that the formulas for the next 10,000 startups is very, very simple, is you take something and add AI. Okay, of course, now, if it's, a, if it's really a commodity, we should also probably reverse that and say, take AI and add X, because, as you know, 
in order to make a commodity valuable, you have to add something special. So if everybody can buy AI, then you have to do something extra to it. Tell a story, it's like selling water. You have to have something extra in order to sell the commodity. So the 10,000 take AI is not just me talking, it's people like Google saying they're no longer gonna be a mobile first company or world. They're going to AI first. And I'll just tell you a few other things that are happening right now to give you a sense of the speed at which this is accelerating. So this is Baidu, the Google equivalent in China. No longer, they have you know, tens of thousands of employees. They don't any longer have the security badge that you need to get in. They, their facial recognition is so good and so secure that all you have to do is show up and it looks at your face and knows whether you are who you say you are or not. It's totally reliable and that's being driven by their own um, AI. Excuse me, I have a cold here. And um, the latest spot, which is one of my favorite examples happening right now, um, is a machine that has AI in, inside a, a tractor, you know, a, a farm tractor. And it's going down, and what's, what it's doing is, um, the way, you know, lettuce and other vegetables is that they're overplanted, there's more seeds than they need, and they um, plant them all, not all of them germinate, but the ones that do, they thin, and this AI will go down and it will inspect each individual seedling one by one, it maps them and knows exactly where they are and decides this one's a little greener than that one, so this one is, will kill that off. We go down and remembers each one, and so it can adjust the fertilizer and the water on a plant-by-plant -plant basis, reducing the amount of chemicals needed, reducing the amount of water needed, and it's being harvested in the same way. So it's doing something that farmers would love to do but are incapable of doing, which is it's giving personal farming attention plant by plant for these vast, vast fields. So that's called precision agriculture. Uh, and that's made possible by AI today. And it's going to transform a lot of agriculture. And then there's these um, translators, excuse me, which are located in the ear, and they're kind of like Google Translate, which you should try if you haven't. But what it does is, if, is, is it translates in real time from one language to another, it whispers in your ears, kind of like the Babel fish. And if two people are wearing it, they can have a conversation back and forth. I'm hearing, uh, they're saying Chinese, I'm hearing English, I'm speaking English, they're hearing Chinese. And it works, uh, you know, it's, I would say, mm, it's about 85% now of, say, being fluent, and um, it'll be up to 90 pretty soon, which is good enough for lots of things. It's not good enough to do a business negotiation, but it's good enough to get around and to have a conversation and to go shopping and other things, and I think it's gonna be very transformative. And that's all happening right now. And then I did this little sketch on the left, which was of a handbag and the AI imagined and filled out and made a kind of a photograph from my sketch of what the handbag looked like in three dimensions. And uh, uh, this is a painting that an AI did. It's obviously alien, okay? It's not a human-like creativity, but these AIs, some of them, we can program to be creative. It's not just that they're machines. They can actually have a spark of creativity, but it's an alien creativity. It's not the same kind of creativity as humans do. So um, they also, it turns out, to not be difficult to program in emotion into machines. And also, we're finding it very easy for us to have emotions about these machines. These are robots that are being tested for their stability, but it looks like they're being tortured. And we kind of cringe at some of the things that they're doing and so we're going to, I think we're going to be surprised by how much we will come to love some of these machines and how much they will be able to show us the emotions of love. If you can kind of imagine an artificial pet, artificial dolls that actually we already have a lot of emotion for, um, it's not that difficult. 
to program in emotion. So the AI skills today, the, the skills that AI can do today are these three, visual representation, perceptions, you know, driving, recognizing photographs, going through videos, anything to do with visual <laughs> perception and recognition, and then anything to do with kind of hearing and speech. The hearing and speech is rapidly approaching the same levels as a good human. And then the third thing is kind of recommendations we know like Netflix and Amazon, but also making decisions about, say, mortgages or uh, analyzing, say, uh, recommending uh, a disease and looking at an uh, x-ray. So those are the things people say, well, how, what's, how is AI going to come into our lives? They're going to come in these kind of three things right now because these are things that can be done. And um, I want to say a couple things about, well, where does it leave us as humans? Because that's a question we all have. I think most jobs are bundles of different tasks. And some of our tasks that we have in our jobs are repetitive tasks, tasks where efficiency or productivity are important. Those are the tasks that we're going to go to the robots and the AIs. The kind of tasks that we will remain with, keep, and, and, and alter our jobs are the tasks where inefficiency is a virtue. So I like to say okay, productivity and efficiency are for robots. We're about the other things. And you may say, well, what's, what are these other things about efficiency? Well, innovation is fundamentally an inefficient process. It requires trial and error, it requires making things, it requires trying things, it requires having things fail. The same thing with science. Science is inherently a inefficient process. If you are a scientist with 100% efficiency, you're learning nothing. That means every, one of, every single one of your experiments works, you have learned nothing. So it is fundamentally, at its core, an inefficient process. Discovery is inefficient. It means dead ends. It means trying, going somewhere that, that um, isn't correct. It means um, trying things that don't work. So um, discovery and even human relationships and art are fundamentally inefficient. So all the things that we kind of love and, and are good to do and should be doing are the things that, aren't, that robots aren't very good at and won't be for a long time. So the parts of our, the tasks that are tedious, repetitive, can be measured in terms of efficiency, where productivity counts, those are the tiny tasks that we're going to give off to the robots. And what happens is that we're in this, and, and, the, and the AIs and all the other technologies that we're inventing will create for us whole new things that we want to try, that we didn't even know we wanted before, and in the, when we first try them, they're going to be very, very inefficient. We won't know what's doing. We won't know how to do it. But over time, we'll figure out how, we'll figure out the aspects of them that are more efficient. And as we do, we'll give those tasks to the robots. So in a certain sense, the human, the job for humans is to keep inventing jobs for robots. Okay. Is the key, and because as soon as we invent things, we begin to, to, to make it more efficient, and that's when we begin to kind of hand it off. So Gary Kasparov it was the world's chess champion, and when he lost about 15 years ago to the supercomputer Deep Blue from IBM, he was very distraught. And then he later on um, came back and said, you know, um, uh, uh, Deep Blue had access to every single chess move that was ever done, and that's kind of unfair. Because if I had access to all those chess moves while I was playing Deep Blue, I would have won. So he decided to make a whole new chess league where you could play as a human with access to the databases. It's kind of like free martial art. You can play any way you wanted. You can play as an AI. You can play as an AI and a human team. And he called the AI human team a centaur. Okay, so centaurs were this combination of the AI and the robot and the AI and, and the human um, together. 
as a team. And centaurs actually had become quite popular, not just in chess, but also in the US military. They call them centaurs, where they are robo-soldiers, but they're not, I mean, they're kind of like soldiers that assisted with AI, rather than being just AI or just human soldiers, they are centaurs, teams. And in, in doctoring, too, um, the best diagnostician in the world is not an AI doctor today, it's not a human doctor, it's the centaur of doctor plus AI. So these centaurs, this idea of teaming up with an AI makes sense because if you follow my earlier point that these think differently, you have two kinds of minds working together, which is better than one kind of mind. So I think the image that we want to take a place is not working against these machines that are going to take our jobs, is that we're going to be working with them. You may, in fact, be paid by how well you work with them. And so um, there will be many different types of AIs and robots, and we will have many different ways of interacting with them, and they will probably continue to absorb the kind of parts of the jobs that we don't actually like. And it's interesting that a lot of the jobs that politicians are fighting over, I think, are jobs that humans shouldn't be doing at all. They're the kind of, like, they're the kind of, they're, they're, they're jobs that we may look back in 100 years and just marvel that, 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 that we thought humans should be good at those or should be doing them at all. And so um, this is the idea of, of, of the convergence of working with the machines. And, and I think the point that I'd like to leave you, the opportunity, maybe I should say, uh, is imagine what would you do if you had a thousand minds, not a thousand human minds, but a thousand smart minds working for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week? What would you do with that power? And that's sort of the opportunity that we're going to be having in the next 20, 25 years. So the second one is interacting. The second long-term trend, which is that what we see is more and more interaction with our technology. We want to interact more, and so I would say, you know, where we're going is we're going to continue to interact more with the things that we make. And they often start off with screen-based worlds, um, where we have screens everywhere, and in the cities in China, the entire buildings at nighttime are screens, and then we have not just the s our screen and the second screen, but sometimes you have the third screen, and there's an infinite number of, a whole ecosystem of screens that we're surrounded by. So I think in some senses, any flat surface can be a screen. They're flexible. And we have moved from becoming, be being people of the book, where the, you know, the Constitution, the Bible, law was the foundation of our culture, to people of the screen. And there's a shift in terms of what that means. The book was fixed and permanent. And it was precise, black and white printing. And from the author came our ideas of authorities. We're moving into this world of the people of the screen of being screen-based, and on the screen things are fluid and open-ended and messy and ephemeral. They are always changing, and the way you have to find truth is you have to assemble it yourself from fact and anti-fact and alternative fact. And so it's an entirely different cultural regime this fluid, liquid, moving, flowing world of the screens. And the way we interact with these screens and devices is going to go beyond just um, our fingertips moving. I worked on this movie with Steven Spielberg, The Minority Report, and the Tom Cruise character is, we imagine them conducting the data, con using his entire body in full body gestures and his voice to interact with his machine. And that was later picked up by the Iron Man movies where Tony Stark character is manipulating big data sets like a beach ball and is a very physical interaction. So it's not just the grand gestures, it's even the micro gestures. So they have these nano radar chips that can detect micro finger movements and also the micro expressions on your faces with the camera pointing back at your face. And 
now they have screens like a Galaxy Samsung that looks back at you. So any screen that you're looking at is looking back at you, and it can tell where you're looking and what you're looking at. And not only that, it can detect your emotions. It can detect about 25 different human emotions. So it can tell when you're looking at the screen whether you're, you're distracted or perplexed or confused or frightened. And it can adjust the content to what you're seeing. Just as if I'm in a conversation with you, I can change what I'm saying based on what I see your emotional response is. So the ultimate way that we interact with our devices is to actually go inside them. And that's what we call virtual reality, to, 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 to disappear into the device itself. And you've heard about VR. It's the th goggles that you put on. And having tried all of them, I have to say it really does work, OK? You are transported to a different place for a very particular reason. And the reason is, is that um, this, this technology works on a different part of your brain than the brain that you use when you're watching a screen or reading something. Okay, so it's, it's just as if um, in cinema, the reason why movies work is because there's a trick on your brain. So you see a cartoon of Mickey Mouse throwing a baseball, you think that there's actually movement, but there is no movement because it's just a series of still pictures, one after another. And it's, you're, it's, the technology is tricking your brain to believe that there really is movement. And VR works the same way. It's tricking your brain in a certain way, your brain system, to believe that, that you are, that there's real presence in a, in a real world when there isn't. So there are two kinds of VR right now. There is this immersive kind that you get with the covered goggles, the ones I was just talking about. And then there's one called AR or MR, you haven't decided yet, mixed reality or augmented reality. And there you have a pair of clear glasses, magic glasses that you put on, and then you will see a virtual chair or a virtual glass, and you can walk around it and inspect it and even move it with your virtual glove, and it feels like it's really there. And when you take off the MR or the VR goggles, you don't remember having seen something. You remember having experienced it. You remember having felt that it was there, okay? And so this mixed reality is actually very useful. It can be done or used for designing products. It can be used for education and training because it's really very, very powerful for those who learn differently, those who have a kinetic full body because you're using your hands and your arms. You're interacting with your entire body and you remember it in a very different way. And it can also be used for the future of the office. That's Microsoft's vision where you don't have an office full of screens. You can have as many screens as you want. They're all free, big, small, tiny, and having tried these, they're very effective. You, they're, they're just like regular real screens. You can have a mouse, and a virtual mouse, and all kinds of devices to, to use them. And so you just put on your magic glasses, and then you have your own office. And of course, you can have a virtual colleague as well. And that mix, that power of mixing the real and the virtual is really demonstrated a couple of years, I mean, um, last year with the Pokemon Go craze, which was really bad virtuality, I mean, bad uh, VR, but it was showing the power of what happens when you mix those two together. So I, I, I think that this has a lot of promise, but I've been saying that for a very long time. So Jerry Lanier um, founded, invented virtual reality in 1989, and he already invented the goggles and the gloves, and it was really pretty good. You could have a sh shared space. Um, and that's me, actually, in 1989, trying it out, and then coming back and saying, this is going to change the world. And nothing happened for 25 years. And the reason why nothing happened was because that technology, which was pretty good, um, 
cost in today's dollars about a million dollars. So it was just way too expensive. And what's happened in the last 25 years has basically been smartphones, which um, had three technologies that became commodities and, and buried in them. The, the, the navigation, the very expensive navigation head tracking stuff is built into your accelerometer and the screens, the, the goggles themselves are using the same technology as the screens of the phones. And then the little video processing chip became, used to become whole refrigerator size equipment. Now it's just again a few dollar chip. So the, as these became commodities, it made possible virtual reality as a commodity. And what's still lacking though, the reason why it still hasn't quite caught on is that more than 50% of your experience happens because of the tactile audio components, and we still haven't figured out how to really make cheap gloves and other kinds of tactile feedback for the cheap consumer varieties. What this is doing, and the point of what I'm talking about, is that we're going to move from thinking of the internet as an internet of information, as an internet of data to an internet of experiences. Because, again, when you take the goggles off, what you remember is having experienced something. And experiences will become the new currency. They'll become the thing that we download. We'll download experiences. We'll buy experiences. We'll share experiences. And it's not just thrills. It's like the experience of having somebody sit next to you. It's the experience of, having, of seeing a demonstration in front of you or being at the edge of a protest or going somewhere where humans don't normally go or find it very dangerous to go to the edge of a volcano. And more importantly, my experience in trying all these VRs for many years and others is that the most captivating thing in VR is not an amazing world. It's not virtual objects that you can move, it's other people. And when other people are involved, you feel as if they're there. You know that they're not there, but you feel as if they're there. So VR, the idea of kind of the lone teenager up in the bedroom by him or herself is not really correct because VR is going to become the most social of all the social medias. And the telepresence really does work. I have tried a number of different types and it's really kind of weird because it's so convincing that I, I, you actually, I feel uncomfortable being close to that virtual person. I'm feeling I'm invading their space, even though I could put my hand right through them. And um, this is just a little hack showing how the, having the two people with visors on can kind of ruin it, but there's a hack so even their faces can show inside this mutual uh, augmented reality space. Even if those avatars in VR are not 100% photorealistic, those avatars capture the body movements of the other of the person who's at the other end of them. So they have the full personality of that person. They look a little bit like them and they have their voice. And if they have eye contact following you, those three things seem to be enough to really convince this other part of your brain that you're really there. The most common demonstration for VR is to put the goggles on in, you're in a room, like a standard office room, and then they have the same room inside VR, a virtual version of it, and then they drop the stairs away, I mean the, the floor away, and they have a plank, and it's like a kilometer down. And they ask you to walk across that plank Nobody can do it. It's like your knees are shaking and you're, you're sweaty and nervous and you're nauseous because you know you're standing in the same room you were before, but your body is telling you you're going to die, that you need to step back because it's operating on a different part of your brain. And that part of the brain can, can feel these other people. And so that experience of being with your friends or strangers is really going to become the new social space, and maybe the next platform after smartphones. And I think of all the things that we're making, almost every commodity is on a downward curve towards the free. The few things that are becoming more expensive in real dollars every year 
our experiences. Concert tickets, babysitting, four-star chef meals, all those things that are experiencing related. And by the way, you don't need a college degree to make a great experience. Almost anybody can. And so I think this orientation to experiences is really what a lot of the new economy is going to be about. So let me tell you the third trend very quickly about um, where we're going. And many people have noticed this, that Uber is the largest taxi cab company in the world and doesn't own any cars, and Facebook is the largest media company in the world and it doesn't own any content. Alibaba is the largest retailer in the world and it does not own any inventory. And Airbnb is the largest lodging company in the world and it owns no real estate. So ownership is not so important anymore. Ownership has a lot of liabilities. And for many things that we're doing, access is in many ways better than ownership. If you can have access to something instantly, anytime, anywhere in the world, why would you own it? Right? So, so, so if, if, and that's been true, of course, for the digital realm, where fewer and fewer people, me included, are buying a movie. When we, if we can have access to any movie anytime, why would we buy it? We don't have to back it up. We don't have to store it. We don't have to upgrade it. We don't have to catalog it. We just have to access it. The same thing with music, of course. Why own music when you could access any music anywhere? Why own books, e-books anyway, when you could have access to all books? Why own games? And so in the digital realm, we're kind of getting familiar with the fact that access often trumps ownership. But that's not just the digital uh, world. It is also now seeping into and maybe even starting to overtake the physical world. So we, if, if we have instant access, or even things like rapid delivery. So now in cities of the world, and even in China, you can get something within a two-hour window or one-hour window. Having something available within an hour, or even it's two hours, is almost as much time as it might take for me to find something in my basement. Right? So, so it's, like, it's almost like instant. You can have instant manufacturing like 3D printing and other kinds of things where you are manufacturing very, very locally. There is constant upgrades where things are being upgraded all the time. All these, like your car, like a Tesla car, where um, it's a very physical thing, but it actually gets better as it goes along rather than getting worse because it's being upgraded. So what we're finding is that even in the physical world, the benefits of ownership are diminishing, the benefits of accessing things are increasing. And we have this idea of this on-demand economy. Basically, if you have, can get things on demand, you don't really want to own them. So there's a search for the Uber of X. What, what else could we do with that besides taxi cabs? What else could we do where we would turn a product into a service? So that's the movement from the solid to the verbs. Rather than try to imagine making something that are products, we try to imagine them as services. And there are about 9,000 different startup companies trying to find the Uber for food, for toys, for furniture, for health equipment, you name it. Someone's trying to reimagine the world as these are not products, but these are services, and that they can be delivered in the same way where people don't have to own them. And I even... You know, there's even kind of a little bit of an urban mo nomad lifestyle, nomadics, where the idea is, is that you kind of imitate the tribal warrior, hunter-gatherer, who's going through the forest, owning nothing, just getting what they need from the environment, using it and leaving it behind as they go along. So kind of like the highly evolved person in 30 years may carry nothing, no phone, because any flat surface would be a screen that they could basically turn into their screen, recognizes their face and says, oh, here you are, here's your screen, I'm now your screen. And so this is the idea that the infrastructure itself would supply what you needed. You travel, you don't have to take luggage because your hotel room would have a shirt that was made for you or waiting for you or whatever it is and you would use it and leave it behind. 
just like the tribal guy going through. That's sort of, that's the, the dream, that's the goal. So you have very little ownership, great agility, empty pockets. So the question people want to be asking is, what can you, what's now owned that could be accessed? Because that's the general drift of things. So sharing is another thing we've heard a lot about. A lot of people know about the sharing economy. But I want to emphasize and enlarge that just a little bit. It doesn't matter what business you're in these days, whether it's chemicals, agriculture, hotels, teaching. It, you're in an information business. Everybody's in an information business. It's like software ate the world. Everything is operating like as if it was software. Everything's becoming more de dematerialized. We, have, we make things with less and less atoms and more and more intelligence and design. That's true for a beer can. That's true for everything. And sometimes even the data about your customers is as valuable as the customers themselves. And it's not just humans. It's like the whole Internet of Things. It's all generating these huge volumes of information and sensors. And what I wanted to suggest, though, is that when we think of sharing, is what we should really be thinking about is collaboration, cooperation, communities. So something like the Wikipedia is possible because we have taken millions of people and they can collaborate to make a communal encyclopedia that anybody can edit. That is miraculous. It's amazing. It's not just about sharing. It's about collaborating at a new scale that was simply not possible before. When we have Facebook with 1.5 billion social connections, that's a new type of collaboration and cooperation. Sure, people are just sharing gossip and cat videos, but they're sharing something. It's the beginning. Imagine what you could do with 1.5 billion people collaborating in other new ways. That's the opportunity that we're headed into, is allowing new tools that will allow us to collaborate and cooperate and share at a scale that was unthinkable before. And we can also think about the entire sharing of the hardware that's underneath. So the, all the phones, all the chips and all the phones and all the laptops and all the server farms together, if you can up all those transistors combining all the ones that are connected, if you can up all the links like synapses in the web, if you take up all the storage uh, material in the entire world that's connected online, it becomes a very, very big brain. It's operating like a supercomputer at a fantastic new rate. So this machine, the planetary machine, is sort of a global machine, and it has like a, a kind of like a heartbeat almost, and they have financial um, movements throughout the world all in synchrony on one day, that's one day's, and all this data that they were collecting, and by the way, VR is going to collect an amount, an immense amount of data from us. All this kind of data and everything is flowing through it. And we have issues with the amount of data that people are collecting and um, that know about us. And, and I think it's inevitable that they're going to, more of our lives are going to be tracked in 50 years than today. That's inevitable. What's not inevitable, what we have a choice about is how it's collected, whether we can domesticate it or not. I have a suggestion about one way, one choice that we have, which is that we want that information to be mutually symmetrical, covalent. I call it covalence, meaning that if they're watching us, we have to watch them. If we're being tracked, we have to track the trackers. That symmetry is actually something we're used to because we evolved for hundreds and thousands of years in small clans where we tracked each other all the time. There was very little what we would call privacy in the clan. Every day, all day long, we knew what each other was doing. It was comfortable because it was mutual. It's not mutual often now, which makes it uncomfortable. But there are tools and technologies which we can use to restore that symmetry. And the second thing I would say about privacy is that they're coupled. Um, when the, if I want to be treated as an individual. I want a personal treatment from my friends, from the government, from other people. And the way to do that, I have to be transparent and open 
to them so they can treat me personally. If I want to be generic and hidden, then um, I can be private. But, I, but to be private, I have to be willing to be treated as a number in bulk because those two axes are bound. So another way of saying this is that ultimate maximum personalization requires maximum transparency. And maximum privacy requires maximum generic treatment. I think we should have a choice in which way those sliders move. But the surprising thing is, is that when we give people the choice with technology to move the slider towards maximum personalization or maximum privatization, in general, people are pushing it always to the other end. They are choosing maximum personalization and maximum transparency. And I kind of summarize that by saying that vanity trumps privacy. <laughs> okay, that's who knew? That's what we discovered about ourselves. I think we're just at the beginning of the sharing world. We're just at the very, very beginning. It can go really far. And the question you want to ask yourself is, what could millions of people collaborating together achieve? And I think we're just at the beginning of that. Nobody has any idea what the new inventions are for. Thomas Edison invented the phonograph. He, late at night, made a list of all the things he thought that it could do. And um, the first idea that he had was it could be commercialized as a way to record the words of the dying. He was totally wrong. Number 10 on his list was it could be used for recording music. Um, the only way that we can understand things is by using them. Social media is less than 5,000 days old. We have no idea what it's good for. We have no idea how to control it, how to use it. We have no idea what we're going to do. And I think that just as we spent, each of us, four or five years learning how to read and write, we didn't just learn by sitting around books, by having friends who had books. We actually had to study it. There may be certain aspects of, say, social media, where we actually have to be taught and learn how to do things. Right? There's no reason why we should expect that the internet is something we don't have to study or learn from. It may take us some time to do that. Your job in two years has not been invented yet because all of us will be newbies forever. Okay? No matter what your age is, you're going to have to relearn and learn things. You've mastered the phone, but now VR and AI are coming along. So learning these new tools often requires unlearning the old one. And the major thing, we have something called design thinking process, which has many different variants, but the, the one that in terms of application to this kind of a place, that I want to, I reduce this to try, do, make, then think and plan, and then repeat. In other words, the first thing you do is to make something, to do something. And it's in the doing that we learn. And the same thing about technology, I think we can't, think too much about these technologies, the way we steer them is by using them. It's by embracing them and trying them and trying to make with them. That's how we learn how to steer them. That's how we learn how, what they're good for. Okay? And this idea of rapid prototyping, which we see evidence around here, is the thing is like you do first and then you think. The major skill in education, in our own lives, is lifelong learning. It's learning how to learn, and more importantly, for all of us, is learning how we learn ourselves. So I just want to end in the last minute talking about the future. It's very difficult to believe. If we went back, sent the time machine back 20 years to tell our friends about what we have, they wouldn't believe very much of it. You have this supercomputer magic stone in your pocket, and it does what? free, all this stuff, there's no economic model. You, you must be lying. So it's, it's, it's really difficult to believe. I've been talking about computers and getting smaller and smaller and being put into our shoes, into our chairs, into our clothes, into doorknobs for at least 30 years, and it was ridiculous. Nobody believed that you'd put a computer into a door. Why would you do that? You can't stay in a hotel room today without having to interact with the computer in the door. So we have to believe the impossible more often. That's sort of what I've learned. Wikipedia is impossible. We have to believe in it more often. And we're also just at the beginning of the first hour of the first day. All right? So, so all this stuff about AI and VR is all ahead of us. It's just an incredible, widening, huge opportunity. And we're just beginning. And there are no AI experts. 
There are no VR experts, especially compared to what we know in 25 years. So we're just at the very, very beginning. And um, when we look back 25 years from now and look back at today, we'll say, oh my gosh, 2017, that was an amazing time. It was the best time in the world ever to be making things because there was, tools were never as cheap. The, the audience was never as big. The money was never as easy to come by. This was, 2017 was the amazing time to start and you had all the beginnings of AI and VR. You, th it was the most amazing time in the world to start something. So I also know that in 25 years from now that the best major technology that will be dominant in our lives is something I haven't even mentioned because it hasn't been invented yet. All right, it's, it, it's the amazing thing. We haven't even thought of it. All that means is that you're not late. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Okay. Okay. Stay yeah. Yeah. Oh, same. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Kevin Kelly, for this yeah. awesome presentation. And you are really opening uh, a new space, a new beginning. There is room for a few questions from the audience. I'm sure there will be questions. My first question to you would be, <laughs> you um, if I would give you a ticket in a time machine, ah. <laughs> which year? Where would you go? Just one ticket. You have like one golden ticket. Where right, would right. you go? So I have, I, have, I have one important follow-up question. Is this a round-trip ticket or a one-way ticket? <laughs> It's a one-way ticket. Okay, all right. That's a big difference. Yes. Um, uh, well, first of all, I would definitely go into the future and not into the past. Yes. Anybody who goes into the past is out of their mind, <laughs> really. And um, I, I'm on a one-way ticket. And I think um, I wouldn't want to go too far where I'm completely useless and out of it. So I think I would go about 500 years. Yeah. Well, is that not far enough or too far? What's <laughs> How about you? Uh, I would go 40,000 years into the 40, future. 40,000? Yes. Wow. Yes. Why 40,000? Well, because I, I think, well, it's also in your talk that you make this reference to the hunting gathering life. Yeah. And I think it's in our biology to live okay. as a hunting and gathering person and, a person and how you could do that again. And I sometimes think about how life was then, but I would right. be really curious to, yeah, to, to see how life is in 40,000 years. If there still will be humans, right. I hope so. I think and if I, I think would recognize them as humans. Yeah, I don't think you'd recognize humans no. in 40,000 years. So, so you, might, you, might miss, you might miss having your humans around. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree it's a long shot, definitely. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe we go into the audience to see if there are questions. I think there are some micro... Microphones, there they are, yes. There's a microphone there. It's difficult for, I see a question here, I see a question there. I think the, the, where the microphone is, the question will be. So it's up to you to decide. Uh, hi. Um, you are uh, yourself, I've heard, very uh, selective about which technologies yeah. you use in your life and which you don't. Right. Will you personally use virtual reality, yeah. and if so, in what capacity? I, I would definitely use virtual reality. Um, and I'm not much of a gamer, so it w um, I'm not that attractive to kind of you know, playing video games. I like to watch other people playing them, but I'm not much of a puzzle maker or a gamer. I would use it for, um, uh, first of all, I would pay a lot of money to use it to do um, travel, business travel without having to travel. Like if I could do a real video conference and have this, you here in my room and, and you were in, you know, you were in Amsterdam and I'm in San Francisco, that's worth a lot of money to me. To, to have that kind of conversation and not have to get on a plane to do it. So that's the very first thing that I would use it for. And we're getting close to that. I would say maybe that's probably within five years. Um, I would definitely use it. And, and again, I have to emphasize that 
Um, this is very different than just seeing a Skype on a screen. It's because some part of my body believes that you are really there, and we can have a conversation, and I can see micro-expressions on your face, and I can see your body language, and it really does work. I mean, it works 90% of what a face-to-face -face meeting would be, and that would really change my life in a big way. This conference is also about, or the, the, whole, the whole event is about uh, uh, senses and sensors. Right. And um, would it be for you be mainly a visual experience, or also materialized smell maybe? Yeah. I think smell is something that doesn't exist in the digital world. Yeah, it, it does. And there's an interesting, like, they've done a couple of interesting experiments. Let me tell you a little bit more about VR, but um, in this idea of kind of doing the telepresence in an office. So um, there was this group, I think they're Microsoft, they had an office in Ireland and they have an office in Seattle. And what they do is they make replicas of the two rooms. They have exactly the same sofas and exactly the same furniture. And so when you're in this room, the virtual, you're in you know, Dublin, I'm in, in Seattle, you sit on the couch there and your avatar is sitting on the couch, exactly the same couch here. Yeah. And so it matches all the body movements. And so you can kind of like, you can feel the couch. It feels like a real couch. So you have some of that additional tactile feel, even though you're not feeling the person, you feel the other things as if, and it's the same couch they have. So you actually are able to transfer that tactile thing right. in a kind of yeah. real way. Yeah. So um, yeah, as I said, more than 50% of the experience is not coming from the visual, but coming from the other yes. tactile audio and smell, if we could do it. And that's really kind of the holdup right now is to have those additional senses. Okay. Um, next question. I see there's a question here and, and here, but we will also go to the back later. So if you have a question in the back, I see your hand. I, I see you. <laughs> so you are the third one. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. Uh -huh. uh, I know you travel a lot in Asia yeah. to forgotten or cultures that are disappearing. Right. And uh, we know you, I think, m mainly from this kind of very future forward optimistic yeah. uh, you know, type of speeches. How, how much of you is nostalgic and how much of you yeah. is hmm. about So, so I, I spend a lot of time these days um, in pretty remote parts of Asia, as well as the cities, um, documenting the disappearing traditions, ceremonies, um, the ways of Asia, the Asian cultures, which are being bulldozed, really, in many ways. And um, it's funny, because I have no nostalgia for them at all. Um, I am capturing them because they're going away and they have a beauty and a richness that I enjoy, but I fully understand why they're going away. So, you know, I was in a, recently in some Dung tribal villages in southern China that are just magnificently beautiful. They're made out of wood. They use no nails. It's kind of like Japanese carpentry. They fit into the landscape. Um, they're, they're stunning in their beauty, and they're really terrible places to live. I mean, like, they, they're cold and drafty. They don't have any plumbing. Um, and people have left them They've abandoned them for the most part to move into the cities where they have airtight, air conditioned boxes with Wi Fi and indoor plumbing. I get that. That's, that makes sense to me. So, my capture of it is this really is that there's a species, a variety of beauty and of life that's going away with, in some senses, a, a, an understandable reason, but I would at least like to capture it and to enjoy it for my own purposes. And so, um, the reason why those people, in the hundreds of millions, there's like 300 million people in China alone who are moving into cities, are buying one-way bus tickets from their beautiful village where they have organic food and <laughs> beautiful settings and strong families and strong communities and they know who they are and they're moving into a city where they have none of those because they have more choices and opportunities in the city. They have at least the possibility of getting education for the kids, health care, voting, all these things. And so um, I understand that, and, and, and I would do the same thing. 
I'm, I'm, I, would, I would come, I would leave my village and move into the city because there's far, far more choices and possibilities in the city than there is in their village. And, um, but I also find a beauty in them that I want to record as a, as a compulsion. There's no, it's not going to stop it. It's not going to reverse it. It's just going to capture it. And I enjoy seeing my own photographs. And that's basically what it's kind of like art. It's completely useless, but cool. But it's an, yeah, it's an, it's an right. image also, right. the relationship between nostalgia right. and the visual image. Right. Uh, there was a question here. So first the question here, and then we go to all the way to the back so that you also get some exercise running with your Thank microphone. you for your inspiring presentation. Yeah, sure. I was intrigued by your statement that AI can be programmed to be creative. To yes. me, that sounds like an oxymoron. Yeah. So, so um, I think we have a very overrated idea of what our creativity is about. I think our I think our creativity is actually pretty mechanical in some some ways, and um, uh, it's that we can engineer. I mean, we can engineer creativity, and so. Um, that seems shocking to us because we have this mystical understanding about it or perception of it that I think is not going to be true. Um, and I think like a lot of things in this realm, intelligence, creativity, consciousness, um, you know, awareness, these are not binary things, as I was trying to explain about intelligence. It's not like you have your intelligence or you don't or, or you have consciousness or you don't. These are all continuums. And they're also highly variable with many different species. And in creativity is the same thing. We, we'll probably find out that what we call creativity is probably five different things. And they're probably a lot more mechanical than what we uh, would assume. Um, and that the combination of these things in the machines will be different than the combination that we have in humans. And so... Um, they are generating creativity in most of our definitions of what we would, however we want to define it, they would pass that definition, um, which means that it's programmable. And sort of what we, what we tend to do is now that the machines can do it, we'll say, well, that's not creativity. Yes. <laughs> it will have a new definition, and then it will do that and say, well, well, well obviously we didn't know what it was, and it's not that, it's something else. And so... Um, uh, like intelligence, we don't even really know what it is. We it's, know it's it. shifting while it's we are shifting trying and, to copy and, it. And, and, and here's the yeah. thing. I actually think that the major microscope, telescope, that the major tool that we will use to find out about our intelligence would be AI, not neuroscience. In other words, we're going to find out more about our own brains and how we think and how our minds work by trying to make them than we are going to by, by using a microscope or a neuron scope. And so um, the, the other virtue of AI is going to be this a primary tool for us to understand ourselves. I call this the kind of the nerd way of doing things. So you have the famous C.P. Snow had the two cultures. He had the culture of scientists and the culture of the um, humanities. And he said they were very different. So in my, in my vocabulary, there's three cultures. There's the scientists and then the humanities. And so the humanities, the way you kind of go about investigating the world is mostly kind of like through introspection and human ex expression. The scientist does a thing where they do a probe with an experiment. They probe it and they kind of experiment on it. The third way is the nerd way. <laughs> the nerd way, the way that you investigate the universe is you try to make something Synthetic. You try to make it. So the way you investigate reality is you make virtual reality. The way you investigate the mind is you make an artificial mind. It's by making things that you discover things. And so that third way, that nerd way, is actually becoming another viable way that we investigate things is by making first. I'm pretty sure there are many people in this region that uh, will be inspired by this and already do this, but now it's official. <laughs> right. There's uh, the, the, the question in the back that I promised, and uh, you have a question? No, let's first go to the gentleman in the back, because otherwise... 
we're losing him. Uh, hi, um, first of all, thank for you for the keynote speech. I wanted to know your thoughts regarding to cryptocurrency, particularly Bitcoin, and whether that could be used in um, artificial intelligence mm. or access, if you like, as it were. So I, I feel I should maybe explain very briefly what Bitcoin is for probably some people who don't know. So um, Bitcoin is a what they call a cryptocurrency. It's, it's, it's numbers. It's, it's, it's math that can serve as um, both value and carry value like a dollar or a euro, but it's also a, a kind of communication. And the, so you can pay for things with the Bitcoin, and they change in value like a dollar or euro does in relative to other currencies. But um, there's a technological innovation behind Bitcoin or under Bitcoin. It's called the blockchain, which is a very complicated technology that is basically it's a shared public spreadsheet that nobody controls that's actually generated by all the, all the users of that spreadsheet. And it does is that each new transaction that's put into the public ledger is encryptedly tied to the previous transaction. So you can't really fake it or it's very believable because, because in order to fake it, you'd have to fake the entire history of the entire economy. So it's just beyond faking because every piece is chained to the previous piece. That's where the blockchain comes from. The Bitcoin itself, I don't know how important that is cryptocurrencies to something like AI. It may be, it may be not, I don't know. But the blockchain technology that underlies that is actually useful for more than just Bitcoins or currencies. It can actually be used for other things where you want to have trust distributed rather than located in a central place. For instance, a bank. So you can also have like contracts or other things that are certifying like a license. So and the way we normally do that is we have an agency or institution whose job it is to certify that these things are true. The blockchain allows you to do something without that certification by just having the entire system itself certify and be trustworthy. So this distributed trust. And that could be very powerful and by making things like contracts or mortgages and other kinds of things much cheaper because you don't have to have that centralized agency, it can be distributed. So that's one of the thinkings. And how that applies to AI, I'm not really sure, other than people kind of imagine a future of an organization where there's no people involved. The organization is sort of yeah. automatic because all these contracts and deals and, and all are being done by scripts and AIs, and there be, you can trust them because they're being distributed. So it's a way of kind of trusting AIs to do something that would normally in the past have been done by a human institution. So that's kind of the yeah. broader vision of blockchain and Bitcoin. Bitcoin well, rising. You know, top. one example that uh, I was reading about recently is that someone was playing poker online with an AI, um, and when you lose, you pay in Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you are playing against this artificial intelligence, right. and of course, often you lose. Right. This brings us to the question that many people are worried about. I sense you are not worried about mm -hmm. it, but we tend to think that we are the dominant species mm. on the planet. Mm. And often we think, will we still be the dom dominant species, or is this already out of the window? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we have certainly taken a dominant stance. Um, the, the dominant species is actually something like E. coli. It's, it's a virus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a bug. There's more of them than of us. They actually decide us. A lot of what we do is really relied or coming out of our own gut microbial. So we have the illusion that we're the dominant species, but it really depends on what you're measuring. Um, I think that um, uh, what we, the future of humanity, first of all, as I said, I think we're going to invent many different kinds of thinking, and we'll see that it isn't a matter of a ladder going up, which is kind of a, a mythical image. Mm -hmm. e even you know, pre-evolution, there was a mythical image of humans stacked up. But even within the evolutionary viewpoint, people kind of imagine you know, the, 
the evolution of the kind of the lizard going out of the water, and then there's the mammal, and then there's the chimpanzee, and there's man. We still have that kind of latter view of ourselves, but the, a truer view of evolution is the one that um, David Hillis devised, which is a kind of a circular radiograph, because every living species today, every species alive today on this planet, including the cockroach and, and the horseshoe crab and, and the starfish, is equally evolved. We, they are equally as that they have gone through the same amount of evolution as we have. Yes. They're just as evolved as we are. So it's really this kind of circle of radio outward evolution. So there really isn't a ladder. So we definitely are dominant in the sense that we've had more impact on the planet than some other individual species. But I think we have a mistake about our own intelligence as being at the center when I actually, as I was saying before, I think it's at the edge. We don't have a general purpose intelligence. We have an intelligence that's very, very specifically evolved for survival of this body on this planet. And when we are able to map all the possible intelligences, we'll find out that we're at the edge somewhere and not really a dominant intelligence. And I think the future of humanity is really a huge question about whether we remain one species or many. Yes. And that is something we don't know. No, and that's an entirely different right. lecture. I sense there are so many topics we could right. still discuss and we could spend hours, days continuing on the lecture, but there are some practical things that people want to get into the train maybe. So we have to wrap it up. Okay. Um, Thank you so much for sure. uh, opening up this new world for us. Kevin Kelly. Thank you for your attention. Sure.